And Our thank you for reading that passage for us, Yvonne. And thank you all for keeping up the clothes swapping table sign, which to me is part of the essence of this church now. So when Fiona and I met, it was a long, long time ago. We'd been married uh, nearly 30 years, and it's before that. We had a friend in our church in Bermondsey who was in her 80s. Her name was Alice, and she used to pray for me every day, which uh, obviously it's worked. Otherwise, I wouldn't be the man I am today. And I would sometimes wonder, what was she actually praying for me? How can you keep coming back day after day, praying for the same person? Uh, what would it be? How do we pray for other people? And uh, a little while after that, we had uh, another friend uh, in that church, um, a couple, and they had a young daughter who they named Hannah. And one night when they were out, uh, Hannah's grandmother was babysitting for her. And when she put Hannah to bed, uh, Hannah told her in her three-year-old way, oh, it's time for us to pray now, Grandma. Grandma wasn't a Christian. She didn't really know what to do. So she just went, um, oh, um, God bless Mummy. God bless Daddy. Amen. And Hannah turned to her in the way only a three-year-old can and said, well, that wasn't very good, was it? <laughs> but it's hard to, to pray for other people, to know what to pray for other people, especially um, if you're not in contact with them a lot and you don't know all their latest news. And when we think, as Christians, we think about, okay, how should we pray? There's, there's one obvious passage that you think of, probably, which is um, the, the best place in the Bible to learn how to pray, and that would be um, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. It's in several of the Gospels. But it's interesting, when you break that down, if you go through it line by line, the whole thing is actually praying for us, ourselves. There's nothing in there that's praying for other people. So it begins by addressing God directly. For our Father in heaven, your name is holy. All of those things. But then when it gets into, give us today our daily bread. Lead us not to temptation. You know, deliver us from the evil one. It's always praying for us. It's not for other people. It's interesting, isn't it? That um, maybe that was the first thing Jesus thought his disciples need to know about praying, was just praying for themselves. But when we come to pray for other people, that there isn't quite so much guidance. So I want to look today at how Paul prayed for the Ephesians. Uh, so we're following on directly from the passage uh, last month, uh, and it's the passage that Yvonne read for us today. <laughs> uh, and it, began, it begins with this. Paul writes to the Ephesians, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, remember, Paul wasn't able to have Zoom chats with the Ephesians. At the time he wrote this, he was in prison in Rome. Um, and we might now think, all right, even before you have video conferencing, you can just send a letter from Rome to Ephesus, which is in Turkey. But in those days, that would have taken months to do, and you'd have to just hope to find someone who was traveling in the right direction, and you could take your letter with them and, and hope that it would arrive, and they wouldn't just forget about it or get waylaid by bandits or something. So Paul's knowledge of what was happening in the Ephesian church would have been well out of date. So most of the while when he was praying for them, obviously when he did know what was going on in their lives, he would have been praying about those things. But mostly he would have been praying fundamentals, if you like. So praying the sorts of things that you can always pray for anyone, anywhere, rather than necessarily things that were addressed to what was happening for them at that particular time. So how did he do that? What was he praying? And I could also say, uh, what was our 80-year-old friend Alice praying for me back in my London days? And what should Hannah's of grand grandmother have been praying? And the answer's in the very next verse. So this is the core of the whole thing, and it's it's, I, I recommend this as a memory verse, Ephesians 1 verse 17. Well worth memorizing. <clears throat> I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. This is what Paul was praying for the Ephesian church. So before we really dig into that verse and unpack exactly what it's talking about, 
I want to draw attention uh, just to one thing, uh, a sort of a side note on this verse. It's very Trinitarian. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. So the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. The idea that God is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. But they all turn up in this verse, as they do in quite a lot of others. So I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son, and that, that Father is the glorious Father, may give you the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all turn up in this verse. I think it's quite neat to see them all so close together there. Anyway, here's the substance. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians the thing that he thinks is most important for them to have, the focus of what he wants for them is this, that they would know God better. And that is the focus there. And in, in the next verse, we'll skip ahead a bit, he's going to go on to say, so that you may know him better, so that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So what Paul wants for the Ephesians is for them to understand, for them to have knowledge and a particular kind of knowledge. What kind of knowledge is he looking for here? Well, I want to be clear, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't read biblical Greek, but I, I, I just kind of poke around a little bit in the, in the odd word here and there just to try and understand a little more about what's going on. And it turns out there are two Greek words that are used for knowledge, uh, even in this uh, letter to the Ephesians. One of them is gnosis, the other is epignosis. Now, epi is a prefix that we have in English as well, don't we? Uh, as well as the Greek, we've got it from the Greek. So your voice box is your glottis, and the thing above that, the flap that stops you from uh, inhaling your food, is your epiglottis, and it means above. So it's the thing that's above your glottis. And um, if you're a fan of triceratops, uh, the fabulous dinosaur with a, a big bony frill, and it's got tiny, like, bumps, ornamental spikes on top of the frill. And they're called the epoccipitals because they're, they're epi-occipital. They're above the occipital region at the base of the skull. So that's what the epi means here. So epignosis doesn't, it doesn't just mean knowledge. In a sense, it means something that's above knowledge. You might think of it as being more like wisdom than just knowing facts. Or some Bible translations in this verse, uh, they call it recognition. So when they say spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know God better, instead of saying no, they translate it as so that you can recognize him, so that you have a better recognition of God. So um, we're not just talking about facts. That's the point here. So John Stott's commentary on this verse says that the knowledge for which Paul prays uh, is more Hebrew than Greek in concept. It adds the knowledge of experience to the knowledge of understanding. More than this, it emphasizes the knowledge of him, of God himself personally. So when Paul prays, uh, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He's not talking about so that we'll have better Bible knowledge, better understanding of facts about God. As valuable as those things are, he's praying that we will know God in a much more personal sense or in an experiential sense. Why? Is that so important? Why does God want that for us? Well, there are two answers to that. One is that itself is the highest goal that we're created for, to know God. We don't really understand a lot about what heaven is like, and I think it's a mistake to try to nail down an understanding of heaven. But what we do know about it is that it's where we will see God clearly, face to face, and where we will know him as fully as he knows us. So the better we can know him on earth now, the more we're preparing ourselves for heaven. So that's one reason. But as well as being the chief end of man, to know God and glorify him forever, it's also a means to other things. And here I want to remind you of, um, it's the prayer of Richard of Chichester, which if you don't know it by that name, I bet you know it by other means. It's this brilliant prayer that day by day, Lord, I ask that I will 
see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. The reason I love that, it's not just three things that happen to rhyme, it's a sequence of ideas and it's in a particular order. Everything of value in our Christian lives begins by seeing God more clearly. When we see him, that's when we love him more dearly. When we love him more dearly, that's when we can follow him more nearly. Now, a lot of the problems we can run into in our Christian lives is if we try and push that bit of string from the wrong end. So if we start by saying, I've got to follow God more nearly, I've got to work harder, I've got to do more, I've got to live in a holier way, I've got to invest more of my time in Bible reading. None of that's bad, but you can't get there by starting at that end. You have to start by seeing God himself. And, know, and, and then you know why those things are important, and you feel the importance of them. We see God more clearly. Then what happens? We love him more dearly. And then it becomes very natural to want to follow him more nearly. So that's the other reason, I think, why Paul is so keen in this verse um, that we will understand who God is. is because that's the also, as well as being our ultimate destination, it's also the first step on the path of our Christian discipleship on earth. Does it make sense? All right, so Paul wants to have better knowledge of God. And I want that for us as well. Where does that knowledge come from? I want to clear away a couple of possible misunderstandings. It doesn't come, first of all, from cleverness. You don't need to be clever to have that kind of knowledge. Do you remember Jesus invites us to come to him as little children? Little children have a lot to recommend them, but they're not particularly clever. That's not the thing. That, that Paul is looking for us to have here. It's because God isn't calling us to have brilliant theological insights about him. He's calling us to know who he is. You know, um, suppose in, in my, um, my human birth, suppose my father was some great scientist. Um, if I was the son of, uh, let's say, Albert Einstein, why not? Let's go with that. Then, if he was at all a good father, then what he would want from me is not that I would understand his contributions to general and special relativity. It's that I would know him as a person. And in the same way, I'm, I'm sure God's happy for us to understand a lot of theology, but what he really wants from his children is for them to know him as father. So it's not about cleverness. It's also not about putting in hours of hard study. And again, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying hours of hard study are a bad thing, um, but that's just not what the focus is here. And as I was reading around uh, all of this, I, I saw somebody's commentary on the prayer of Richard of Chichester, and this, he, this person who I will not name to protect the guilty, he broke it down by saying that uh, when we need to see God more clearly, that means we need to learn more doctrine about God. It really isn't. I don't at all believe that's what Richard meant, and I know for sure it's not what Paul meant. He wasn't calling for us to understand more doctrine, as valuable as that is, but to know God himself. So, I don't know, sometimes I feel like people have the impression when we get to heaven it's going to be um, all quizzes about the Bible genealogies. You know, We'll turn up there and, and we'll meet Peter and he'll say, in 1 Chronicles 2, verse 37, Zabad begat Ephlal, but who did Ephlal beget? Does anyone know, by the way? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> uh, it's Obed. Yeah. Uh, for reasons I can't really explain, that was the first Bible verse I ever memorized. As a, as a, as a new Christian at age 16, I thought there was something funny about that. But that's not what God cares about. He doesn't care about whether you've memorized the, the Bible genealogies. He doesn't care about whether you know the difference between Athanasius and, I don't know, pick another famous Christian theologian. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't not matter at all. There are people who need to understand that stuff, but it's not the focus. So, if the knowledge that God wants us to have doesn't come through our innate cleverness and it doesn't come through our study, how does it come? Haha, 
It's easy. It's right there in the verse. It comes by the Holy Spirit. Let me read you the verse again. I'm going to read it lots of times because I, I want it to really sink in. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now, Jesus says the same thing, by the way, if you don't trust Paul. Uh, Jesus himself, in John chapter 14, says that when, when I give you the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the key here is not our intelligence, it's not our study, it's the Holy Spirit. It reminds me, actually, of a famous verse in Zechariah about how the temple was going to be rebuilt. And God speaks to Zechariah and says, not by might, nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the same thing applies here. You know, building the temple of our understanding of God. It comes about not by might of the brain, you know, not by power of accumulating facts, but by the Holy Spirit. And this is very good news for us because, you know, we're not all given the same level of intelligence. We don't all have the same educational opportunities, but we do all have the same Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit. Uh, later on in the same letters to the Ephesians, Paul writes, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Now, each of us is called to receive that same Holy Spirit of wisdom and of revelation who will teach us all things and remind us of everything that Jesus said and who shows us the Father. So how can we know Jesus better? It's kind of the core question of the Christian life, isn't it? How can we know him better? How can we understand him? And Christians through the ages have, have looked into this and found so many different answers. Uh, I recommend a book by Richard Foster and Gail Beebe that's called Longing for God. Uh, and that's a kind of historical devotional survey, if you like. It looks at maybe 30 famous, influential Christians going all the way back to Augustine and coming up through the Reformation and so on, and looking at the distinct emphasis that each of these Christians had in how to approach God, how to come closer to him, how to understand him, how to know Jesus better. And part of what's fascinating is how different these 30 or so people are in their different emphases, and yet they are all very much pointing towards the same goal. Uh, but Paul's answer is simpler than any of them, you know, which is that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you should ignore all the centuries of experience of, of Christians wiser than us who have found all sorts of different paths towards better understanding God, and that, which is why I recommend the book. <laughs> Otherwise, I would say don't bother with it. But ultimately... The goal of all of that, all these different ideas of all these different Christians, the goal is that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will help us to understand who God is. And then on to verse 18, Paul is almost reiterating the same thing. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know now again, notice it's the eyes of your heart. It's not the eyes of your brain. Um, it's not just about what you know in your head. It's about what's in your heart. And to quote John Stott again, he makes the observation that in biblical usage, the heart is the whole inward self comprising mind as well as emotion. So the idea here is, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, meaning I pray that your whole person mind and emotions and spirit and soul will be enlightened to see who God is, to better understand who God is. And that passage then goes on to list three particular things that Paul thinks we should know and that he's praying for the Ephesians to know. Uh, so let me just read that passage again. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, 
and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul is really dense, isn't he? There's so much substance in each of these verses. You could just pick them apart. So um, I don't want to um, outstay my welcome. I'm not going to talk in any detail about those three things. I just want to note that he talks about the hope to which he has called you. So here is referring to something that God has already done in us. He's already called us. So Paul is praying for the Ephesians to understand what God has already done for them, the calling that he's given them. And he prays that they will understand the riches of God's glorious inheritance in his holy people. In other words, he's praying for the Ephesians that they'll understand what is to come, what God has planned for them. This inheritance that we touched on briefly when I was here last time of a complete restoration, not just of our own individual selves, but of humanity as a whole and the physical universe that we live in. These extraordinary um, goals that God has that are almost too high for us to understand what they are. The riches of his glorious inheritance, which in some way that we don't grasp is in his holy people. In other words, is it in us? So Paul's calling us then to see what God has already done for us and what he will do for us and through us. And the last of those three things he lists is God's incomparably great power for us who believe. Um, I want to note briefly just a couple of things about that last one. First of all, God's incomparably great power is one thing. You know, you, you could have incomparably great power and use it like Voldemort for destruction. Or if, you're, if Voldemort isn't quite your thing, then uh, I guess Darth Vader would be there. Um, these people have great power. Not incomparably great power, but power. And you could imagine God having incomparably great power and using it to be a tyrant, to be a God who is only to be feared and not to be loved. And that's why it's so important that Paul, when he's talking about this, doesn't just say God's incomparably great power, but his incomparably great power for us. His power is for us who believe. That the God that Paul is praying for the Ephesians to know is a God who is for them and whose power is for them and who is at work in them to bless them. And I'm going to finish uh, just looking at the second half of that verse and on into verse 20, which is Paul talking a little more about the power that is at work in the Ephesians and by extension at work in us. He says that power that's at work in us now is the same power as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Now that is the greatest power that has ever been exerted in the whole of human history. No greater thing has ever been done than raising Christ from the dead. Now that wasn't just like raising Lazarus from the dead when a body that had been dead came back to life and lived probably another 40, 50 years and then died again. Raising Christ from the dead was something altogether different from that. A transformation in the nature of the universe. The extinction of death itself as a concept. A triumph over death and hell. Uh, a rewriting of the rules of what it is to be human. The creation of eternal life for everybody who will accept it. So think about what God did there. Think about the power that was required to do that. And then think about his great power for us who believe, the power at work in us, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. An incredible thing. Now, my question, and I know the answer is no, but I'm going to phrase it as a question, is do we feel the truth of that in our lives? So, you know, day to day, as we're bringing in the milk in the morning, or, well, that's a strange example. Who gets milk delivered anymore? All right, as we're popping out to the shops to get some milk, or um, doing the laundry, or, in my case, dealing with endless problems with our utility suppliers, and, and that kind of, the grinding 
boring stuff of everyday life. How often do we feel that an incomparably great power is at work in us that's the same power as that that raised Christ from the dead? I don't feel that all the time. I want to be honest with you about this. And that's exactly why we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's why Paul prays that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will keep reminding us of these truths, will show us these truths. And the very last point that I want to make, um, as you can see, I'm, I'm much sharper time-wise than I was last time. The very last point is this. We've been talking about how Paul is demonstrating how he prays for other people and saying that this is how then we can pray for other people, even if we don't know what their latest news is. It's always something good to pray for people. Uh, to pray, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. My final point is this. That's also such a good way for us to pray for ourselves. Such a helpful thing for each of us to have. So I could rewrite it, making it all about me. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I may know him better. And each of you can pray that, and I highly recommend it.